I'm never fully in the moment. And when I point it out to Jerry, Jerry goes, oh, I'm never in the moment. I'm always mining for material. But I said, isn't that terrible? He goes, no, I don't care. I love it. He has no problem with it whatsoever. And, and I say to him, how can that not affect your life? How does it not affect your relationship with the kids in your life? And he goes, well, no, that, you know, he's fine with that balance or lack of balance. Uh, I know it affected my life and not always in a good way. And I had a little bit of balance. I have to tune it out sometimes because I'm telling you, I don't know if this is true of you, Terry, but I have a radio show going on in my head all the time. All the time. I can, I can, I'm just, I hear it all the time and I just quickly write it down and then I go and do it on the air. So what's going through your mind right now? Well, I mean, I'm focused on what we're doing, but... And I know what it'll give me. I'll be here, I'll go home, I'll do, I do transcendental meditation, I'll be doing it, I'll be getting into it, and that show's going to start working its way into my head. I'm glad you brought up TM, because you've been meditating yeah. since you were 18. Right. And you find that your mother taught you. And it was a profound change with my mother that got me into it. My mother was a depressed woman. Uh, she was shy. Uh, she had a horrible life. Right now I actually have the sunroof open a little bit. I'm on Lakeshore Drive heading south, so I'm going to close that so you can see how the microphone works. Um, for Amazon people, I will be uploading this to YouTube as well, so you can see it in actual like high quality. So it, it records at 720p uh, if you want to save file space or at 1080p. Um, I think it's 30 frames per second. I'd have to check though, and I'll post that uh, in my review. Um, let's see. The mount is nice. It uses a mini USB, which is a little older, but um, it comes with all the proper stuff that you need to hook it up. And all you really need to get is a uh, micro SD card. So it doesn't have to be anything super fancy. We're not recording in 4K here, uh, 1080p. You can get a standard sand disk for 20 bucks, and that can be like a 128 gigabyte, I think, these days. So, um, yeah, and you can get a smaller one too. Uh, it does have G sensor collision, um, so if someone were to hit me, it would save the recording and uh, prevent itself from being uh, re uh, overwritten because right now it's doing three minute segments. I'm going to obviously combine them all together when I edit this, uh, and by edit I mean combine them. I don't do all the fancy stuff. And, um, yeah, it would, it, but then when the card fills, it loops over itself and records over the information that's not, um, locked out. Like a collision or something like that. Um, the menu system is really easy to set up. So you, the first time you boot it up, you put your micro SD card in there uh, prior to turning it on. And then you can format it through the menu system as well, which I definitely recommend because they have uh, certain formatting settings that are specific to the camera. So it's always good to format um, with the device you're going to use. <clears throat> but you can always take it out later and transfer it to your computer. Um, and uh, take a look at what you recorded. So, hopefully, the license plates are showing up. It's very sunny out today, blue skies. 
Um, honestly, this is a perfect fall day in the Midwest, so I am loving it. Um, but again, the settings are really simple, straightforward. Set that to 1080p, put your uh, G sensor on, and if you want, I think you should have it hardwired, but if you want to do parking collision where somebody, if they bump you, uh, it records only in the front, of course, um, then you can do that as well. But otherwise, it's the, the battery really isn't meant for um, much use when the car is not turned on and it's not plugged in to a power source. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, there are other cameras out there by Vantru. I've actually used uh, about a year ago in the past uh, the N2 Pro. That's got a front and a cabin one, but that's really like, a lot better for Uber and Lyft drivers um, so they can record the people that are in their cabin. In fact, I was coming back from O'Hare the other day and I saw somebody, or maybe it was JFK. Um, they had the uh, N2 Pro in there, so. Um, I updated this to the current firmware. Vantru has it on their website, vantru.net. Uh, basically, you just download the appropriate firmware for your camera to your desktop. It's a zip file. Unzip the, um, the file, put it on your micro SD card, power the camera on, and it'll update. And then uh, you can delete the file or format whatever you want to do. Um, don't format if you don't want to lose videos though. So um, I'll put the radio back on. I was listening to NPR um, just because I can't put music on due to copyright stuff. So I'll record a little while, enjoy the view of uh, Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. The compulsive disorder. Yeah. What are your OCD? I took too much. Oh my God! When I when I really suffered uh, badly from it, uh, and I, I still do to a degree, but it's not as bad. But I would, it was magical thinking. It would be, um, uh, geez, let's say. Uh, Actually, I have a podcast that I'm supposed to be working on. Oh no! Good thing that was only a couple seconds. This is the one spot Chicago have where they need to build like a ramp or the underground tunnel under this light. It's so stupid. <laughs> Alright. In research, I don't think it's 100% reliable research, but I, there was this way that that one study was the thing that got everybody's attention, and I think it's sort of indicative of a lot of how we think about education, that, like, if there is a quick fix out there, we are going to grab it. And so even though, you know, the book was talking about, like, what I felt to be pretty deep systemic things about how, that how kids get traumatized and how stress, like, affects our biology and what happens in, like, different sorts of classrooms and classes, a lot of the coverage I felt like got boiled down to that. So the third book, after the Harlem Children's Own book and, uh, and How Children Succeed, Helping Children Succeed, was about trying to explore this idea of environments. Um, and so the thesis of that little book was that it is the environment that shapes young people's non-cognitive skills, their grit and everything else. And so rather than thinking about it as a personal thing, like, well, you've got grit, you don't have grit, you've got grit, you don't have grit, educators and parents and legislators and everybody else should think about the environments that they're creating around kids. That's our responsibility, the adults, not the kids, and think about what kind of environments are most likely to help when it comes to those kind of things. Now take us to college. Why well, was college a part of the educational space that you want to take Because I think it has this huge role, bigger than it used to, in social mobility. And social mobility, this idea of you know, young people to change their lives, reach another class, reach another kind of life as adults, has been something that has run through everything I've written. It was what drew me to the Harlem Children's Zone, it was what drew me to a lot of the research on how children succeed. And what became clear to me in that reporting was that these years after high school were incredibly important in determining the trajectory that kids would have, especially kids who were growing up without a lot of money. 
and I just wanted to try to figure out how to report on that. I was also drawn to that particular time, just like as a journalist, because everyone I talked to who was going through this process, especially kids <coughs> from low-income homes, whatever was happening, whether it was working or not working, their stories were fascinating. Like they were trying to come to terms with themselves and their past and their future and the systems that they were embedded in. So the opportunity to just talk to a lot of young people in that situation was really fun. Because you followed kids around, like, how did you understand school differently? Because it is a different world than when you were a student. It's a different world than when I was a student, when I was a teacher. You know what I mean? Like, what was, what was that like? I mean, it's just so much more intense. There's just so much more pressure. I mean, the, the high-income students who I wrote about, especially uh, the ones who were the students of this the $400 an hour SAT tutor in Washington, D.C., who I reported on, I mean, they had all kinds of advantages, right? I don't feel too sorry for them, but in fact, their lives were super stressful for adolescents. It's just oh, there's a, a huge sailboat out there. All they were thinking about was this one <laughs> number and this one question. It's got to be one of the biggest sailboats but, I've ever uh, seen. For low-income students as well, which is this amazing pressure of, like, figure it out, do the right thing, but so little support and so little information about what the should actually do. And I don't think that was true. You write about the difference between the experiences of kids and families who, like, they always thought they were going to go to college, they did da, 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 and then the kids who didn't necessarily want to go to college but realized that they might have limited options with regard to social mobility if they didn't go to college. And the kids with those experiences might end up at community college. And what did you find about the difference between the way either the world treated them or the structures were set up to help them succeed? I, mean, I feel like low income students in both of those situations, we've created a lot of mm -hmm. obstacles for them. But they're different obstacles, and I think it's useful to think about them. Police reported ahead. Them what happened so, to Cookie Monster? Uh, you know, there's like super high achieving kids who are applying to the most selective institutions. There are all kinds of obstacles for them. It's just a whole lot harder to get into those schools if you don't have a lot of money than if you do. It's harder to afford tuition. Um, it's harder to afford, you know, the SAT. Oh, man, they had the Cookie Monster on ways for months. But everything, like the sports that you play, everything that admissions officers of those schools look for correlates with family. I don't see Popo. So that's one set of obstacles. But then there's this other group of students who I think we pay less attention to, in part because their narratives are sort of less clear and neat, um, but whose experiences from a policy point of view are much more important, probably because there are so many more of them. And these are kids, yeah, don't particularly like high school, right? And in the past, a few decades ago, it was clear that if you don't like high school, when you finish high school, you should stop going to school, right? You should get a job where you work with your hands and support your family. And then the economy changed, and it is extremely hard to do that now. And I feel like this is sort of one of the big changes over the last few decades that we have not wrestled with. You know, it's behind all sorts of political movements that we want to tell folks from that background, like, oh, there's still lots of good jobs out there. There's still lots of options for you and not say <laughs> things have changed. And when we do say things have changed, we put all the pressure and all the responsibility on the students, on the young people, and say, like, okay, you need some kind of college degree. You figure it out. You pay for it. You get it. Whereas, in fact, you know, the, the idea of, like, public high school, when it was invented a century ago in this country, was we, as the public, are going to, for free, provide you with the education that you need in order to have a middle-class life. And then if you want to go beyond that, it's up to you. Not anymore. We should do the same thing now, but it doesn't stop at high school if we want to do that. I do want to ask you about community college, because you talk about, and we know that there's not high graduation <laughs> rates, not a lot of resources. Did you come out of this experience thinking, do we abandon community colleges and try something else? Like, is it, you know, and I say this because, especially in the, the left right now, it's like free college and da da da, but it's like, we give you free access to something that just doesn't work. Is that even like a good, do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's this really interesting paper by this economist, uh, David Deming, who was trying to figure out, like, where we should put money. If we're going to spend more money on higher education, what would be most effective in terms of helping more people get their degrees and graduate? And I think about it a lot because of this talk about like making college free. And basically his argument, he uses you know, complicated tools of an economist, so I can't tell you if it's true or not, is that every dollar spent on just making a college better is a better investment in those students than giving money to students for tuition. What's striking is that we've done the opposite, right? So especially with community colleges, but with all public universities, we have cut per student funding adjusted for inflation since about 2001 by 16%, right? So at this moment when all of the signs in the economy are that young people need more education, we are cutting significantly the amount that we spend on public education. And so 
and then there are like, of course, some community colleges are not graduating students, right? Like, I mean, there's all the problems that the students are bringing to community college, but mostly it's like, well, you know, you spend $15,000, $20,000 a year on a high school student, a public high school student, and then they get to community college and you're like four or $5,000 a year on them. So it's not as good an education. You know, I hate to just say, like, throw money at the problem, but, like, we should throw some money at the problem, right? That really is just a question of resources. And I feel like both on the left and the right, there has been this sense that graduation rates are terrible, right? So there's this sense of like community college is just a disaster and we should just get as many kids as possible out of community college and into something else. But to me, the answer is just to make community colleges better. They are a great solution. Like to me, they are the best solution that I can think of for what ails our higher education system. Because so much of the problem is young people getting out of high school and not quite knowing what they want to do and knowing that they all right, so now that we're out of the loop, I think um, what I'll do is on my way back into the city, I'm heading into the south suburbs now, uh, the lighting should be different, so I will uh, turn that on. Come on, merge in <coughs> on, the, uh, on the way back. So, hey, if you made it this far, congratulations. That's pretty great. Uh, my videos are always unscripted, and I just, I kind of do whatever. I don't like doing fancy, um, uh, well, you know what I'm talking about. It's definitely not a high-end YouTube video. But, gets the point across of how the footage looks. That's what's important. Alright, see you on the flip side. Got off 55 and heading on to Lakeshore North. I'm going to continue listening to this week's uh, edition of my pod, the podcast I listen to every week. It's called Pod Save the People um, by Crooked Media, and I'm in no way affiliated with it, but if you're into, this is just a side, um, if you're into social justice and learning a bit more. Um, about some of the inequities in our country, then uh, check it out. It's good, and I've been listening to it for two years. We need to elect them faster. We need to go to the state level, elect better governor, and uh, we need a president who actually. Uh, boy, we need a president. Right, right, right. We need a president. <laughs> we need a president. Right, we need a president. Uh, <laughs> we need a president. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A president would be would be great on this issue as and so many others who listened to experts who understood science who didn't scapegoat people and I think if we did that then we could help those communities who, who might otherwise be lost in that. Stephanie I wanted to ask you like how have you found supporting family members in the sense that you came to this as you said like not by choice as a family member someone who was battling addiction what have you seen to be effective in helping people who are Impact. Heavy traffic reported ahead. Did by addiction, but are not addicted themselves, and make sense of how to be the best support, how to love, how to not enable, like do all of those things. I unfortunately hear from most family members after they have lost their person, and they're reaching out to say, "Hey, I read your book, or I listened to the trailer, and I lost this person, and I lost that person," but. The whole reason this thing is happening is because someone reached out to me who had lost her brother the same way. And you know that person. It's your producer, Jessica Cordova Kramer. And she had lost her brother in 2017 of a fentanyl overdose. And here we were just perfect strangers. But the first time we talked, it felt like I'd known her my entire life because we had this shared trauma. And just doing this show and telling her brother's story and, and reaching out to people online and I mean, the emails we've gotten have just been, you could sort of make a template. And what they say is that I feel completely unseen. Nobody seems to understand what I'm going through. And I heard your story and you understand and I feel connected and I feel like I belong to a community for the first time in however long. And that's really powerful. And I think that for people who are currently struggling with this, that the idea of 
community and connection feel not natural when when someone is in their disease the symptom of the disease is that you do terrible things you uh -huh. need to use drugs or you feel like you're gonna die your brain needs those drugs to survive it is as important to you as oxygen if not more important and so you act out you steal you lie you do whatever you have to do to get those drugs and so for family members who are dealing with that there's this misperception that you know this old intervention model where you say if you don't go to treatment now you're out of the family and I will have no contact with you and you know you put them in a room and tell them all the terrible things you've done there's data that suggests that isn't it's effective not it's not effective to put somebody in a room and tell them what a terrible person they are and then say meet my demands or else and so I think approaching it with compassion approaching it with love approaching it with the knowledge that this is a disease of brain structure and function and that relapse is part of the disease and just trying to stay connected as best you can it doesn't make sense to move into somebody's house and act as their bodyguard as much as you want to i certainly wanted to do that with my brother but i had a baby at the time that i was nursing i couldn't move into his house in la i lived 2,000 miles away so you know we have to find ways to stay connected stay in a place of love and support even when it feels like you don't want to because what other choice do you have you know <laughs> You know, if they're your family, if they're your friend, if they're your loved one, you want them to live. And that's how we're going to get there, is through love. Just coming out of the shadows is the first step towards making progress. Because for my family, I mean, we didn't talk about my father, even inside the family. It was just something that we lived with our entire life and never discussed because it was somehow embarrassing. We thought it reflected badly on us. And we thought, it, well, we were the only person who ever had a person in our family who was addicted. And it wasn't until I started, and I was sort of forced to talk about it, because people asked when we came up with the Ithaca plan, they're like, why do you care about this so much? Why don't you just leave it alone? This is, you know, you got elected, you're about to be reelected, you don't need all this stuff. So I had to say, well, this matters to me on a personal level. And I was surprised. Everybody in the meeting came up to me and whispered, actually, yeah, my, my father, too. My mother, too. My cousin too. But the fact that nobody could say that out loud in the room meant that we couldn't compare stories. We couldn't spot patterns. We couldn't recognize ways in which the system had failed every single one of our family members. I think there are a lot of people who are sufficiently convinced that addiction is a public health issue who are also like, how is fentanyl, which is not like growing on trees, how is it in so many people's communities in this way? What do we do about that? Yeah, smart targeted enforcement really helps. I think it also helps to decriminalize drugs. They both sound contradictory, but they're really not. You know, we made alcohol legal, right? But we regulate it so that when you pick up a bottle of beer, you can look on the side and you can say, oh, that's 6% alcohol, right? Or you buy a bottle of bourbon and you say, okay, that's 40% alcohol. And never inside that 40% alcohol bottle is actually 90% alcohol because we have regulators who uh, check and make sure. I think that would go a long way. Uh, now, I think we're a long way in this country from doing that, from doing what Portugal, for example, has done. So in the meantime, we can continue, I think, very smart targeted enforcement, fentanyl, much of which is coming from, from China, of course, trying to stop that before it makes its way through our ports. It's not coming to the large part over the, the southern border. So it's convenient for the president to say so. It's just not true. It's coming through the courts. I think, though, we need to be aware of, you know, what's called the iron law of prohibition, which is that when you try and prohibit something, it just becomes more potent, more powerful, and more deadly as smugglers and drug dealers try and shrink it down to size to make it through. That iron law of prohibition works, by the way, for the same way for, like, weapons. And that's why we've seen an explosion of AR-15s in this country is because even though we didn't prohibit them, the NRA convinced half the country that President Obama was in the process of prohibiting them, and so they sold a ton of them uh, because people thought, oh, I, I need to buy it now in the last week before, you know, the president comes for our weapons. Stephanie, what do you want people to know about Last Day, about your podcast? We're trying to do a few things here. We're trying to obviously reach these people who are personally touched by this, who are affected by it, who... Uh, have family members who are personally struggling with it, it's going to help you. It's going to be a really good resource for you. It's going to make you feel like there's somebody out there that understands what you're going through, that hears you, and that can provide some some solutions. 
I would love it if people who completely disagree would listen to the podcast. I can't tell you the amount of times online. I can't count them. My brother was relatively, you know, a public figure. And so it's carte blanche to just bash him, even though he's, he's dead. People will say, oh, he's a junkie. He deserved to die. Anyone who sticks a needle in their arm deserves to die. I would love for them to listen to the show because I feel like they need to be educated, right? It, it's, it's, I can understand how you would think that. It seems like a choice, but please listen and know that it's not. I didn't expect when we started, I thought we were going to tell some personal stories and, you know, form this community, which we are. What I didn't expect was how much it's split on whether they approve of Democrats' impeachment inquiry by a 49 to 46 percent margin. Independents are a critical group to watch, and they are not quite on board. Half of them say they disapprove of the impeachment inquiry. That shows Democrats have some work to do to convince them. The pollsters warn that views can change quickly given the speed of new developments in this story. And Americans are engaged. Seven in ten people say they're paying attention to the news. The poll of 864 Americans was conducted Wednesday night. Domenico Montanaro, NPR News, Washington. Cuba's Raul Castro cannot come to the U.S. According to new sanctions slapped on the communist country's former president by the U.S. State Department. As NPR's Kerry Kahn reports citing gross human rights violations. U.S. is also banning visas for Castro's four adult children. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced the sanctions in a tweet calling the ban necessary due to, quote, the Cuban regime's disregard for human rights and its support of the Maduro government in Venezuela. The Trump administration says hundreds of Cuban intelligence and military officers work directly with the Venezuelan leader to keep him in power and that both countries are responsible for gross violations, abuses, and torture. Cuba says its personnel in Venezuela are doctors and other civilians. Castro, who is now 88, stepped down as president of Cuba last spring, but is still the leader of the island's Communist Party. His last travel to the U.S. was in 2015. Kerry Khan, NPR News. Stocks lost their earlier gains, dragged down by concerns about the impeachment inquiry. The Dow was down 79 points. You're listening to NPR. 71 degrees at 5.04. I'm Nava Lara with WBEZ News. Illinois Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy today pressed the acting director of national intelligence to protect the inspector general who helped bring a whistleblower complaint forward. Today, members of the House Intelligence Committee questioned Joseph McGuire. Krishnamurthy, a Democrat who represents the West and Northwest suburbs, wanted assurance from McGuire that he would protect Michael Atkinson, the U.S. Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, for bringing the whistleblower's information forward. What lends real credibility to the whistleblower's complaint is the fact that Mr. Atkinson, an appointee of the president, would actually bring forward a complaint against his boss. McGuire responded to the congressman that he absolutely would try to prevent retaliation against Atkinson. The new director of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement in Chicago's field office is no fan of the city's status as a sanctuary city, but the mayor says she has no plans to change that. WBEZ's Michael Blanket reports. At his first press conference, Director Robert Wadian wasted little time attacking Chicago's policy of not allowing police officers to work with immigration agents. My message is simple. Challenge your community leaders to stop putting politics ahead of public safety. But at an impromptu press conference outside of ICE's downtown headquarters, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot was unrelenting. We are not allowing our police department to support any ICE immigration efforts in this city, period. Wadian says he hopes to work with the mayor. Michael Puente, WBEZ News. Officials in Joliet say four deaths and three overdoses in the past week are believed to be linked to cocaine laced with fentanyl. The Joliet Herald News reports responders treated three men and one woman ages 28 to 39 who overdosed earlier this week in Joliet. Police say the 39-year-old woman and the 29-year-old man were later pronounced dead. Two other men are hospitalized in critical condition. On Sunday, Joliet fire personnel found a 40-year-old man dead and another 35-year-old unconscious after a suspected overdose. Police in Lockport say a 36-year-old man was found dead at his home of an overdose. A field test detected fentanyl, a powdery substance that was found nearby. In sports, the White Sox continue their series against Cleveland tonight while the Cubs finish their three-game series against the Pirates this evening. I'm Alba Lara, WBEZ News. 
Support for NPR comes from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, supporting efforts to promote a just, equitable, and sustainable society in its hometown of Flint, Michigan, and communities around the world. More at Mott.org. And the listeners who support this NPR station. This is 91.5 FM. Good afternoon. I'm Heidi Goldfein, along with Shannon Heffernan. Good, good afternoon, Shannon. Good afternoon. You are listening to WBEZ. There is much, much more news ahead. In fact, we are going to hear from House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff. He'll be on the program in just a few moments. Also, uh, how voters around the country are reacting to the calls for an impeachment inquiry. That is what is ahead. We are taking just a couple minutes to remind you that this is the very last day, in fact, the last couple hours of our fall pledge drive. And we have so many incentives. The programming alone is an incentive, but we have lots of other encouragement things. <laughs> is that right? Lots of, things lots, to encourage, lots, lots of things to, to encourage, encourage you. WBEZ.org slash donate, 888-915-9239. And we just walked into the studio, Heidi and I, and they told us, you have a dollar-for-dollar dollar match. I love these last-day dollar-for-dollar matches. They really are a big help to us. Here's how a dollar-for-dollar dollar match works. If you donate $10, it turns into $20. If you donate $100, it becomes $200. No matter what you give, give it doubles that's thanks to sharon karsten get in on this dollar for dollar match we're only going to be doing it for like the next hour call us at triple eight nine one five nine two three nine or go online at wbez.org slash donate you know shannon it really is easy to take good journalism for granted because that's right each and every single day when you tune into wbez that's what you get now today think about why you tuned in to wbez this morning when you got up today turned on the station why because you knew you would get a reason in-depth contextual look at the latest news um, about the whistleblower at the um, unclassified um, report right. all of that you knew you would get that here on wbez you've been tuning in and out throughout the day right now we are asking you to become a member of wbez to support that news that you rely on that you have relied on today and that you will rely on for the next year wbez.org slash donate the number is 888-915-9239 and as shanna was just saying we're in this crazy dollar for dollar match period for the next hour when you contribute ten dollars a month it becomes a twenty dollar a month contribution. Your dollars go twice as far right now. So when you think, when's the best time for me to become a member? <laughs> now is the best time. WBEZ.org slash donate. That wonderful journalism Heidi was talking about, that's funded by listeners. 60% of funding that makes up our budget comes directly from people like you. This year is going to cost us $1.2 million to bring you NPR. That's a lot of money. Here's the good news. You don't have to do it alone. Nope. We don't work nope. by having one person just hand us a million dollar check. Although if you got it, we'll take it. Um, it works by it'll be double. <laughs> it'll be double. <laughs> it works by a lot of people making tiny <laughs> donations coming together on a team like this Matt from Sharon Karsten. Um, we want you to be on that team. Give us a call, 888 or go online to wbez.org slash donate. And you may be thinking, what else do you have for me? Well, how about this? When you become a member right now at $10 a month, your contribution is doubled, and your name goes into a drawing for this amazing trip. You may have heard us mention it today. It's a safari in South Africa. We are giving away four-night accommodation from Cape cool. Town, a three-night stay at a, a private uh, animal reserve, round-trip airfare to Johannesburg, guiding, <laughs> driving, and walking tours. A safari is an amazing experience. I was lucky enough to have one. Of course, I lost my camera, so oh. I don't have the pictures, but I have it in my mind's eye. Somebody is going to win that, and you have just about an hour and 50 minutes to get your name in on that drawing. Make your dollars count. Become a member right now. WBEZ.org slash donate. 888 I love pledge drives because it's a moment when we really get to hear from listeners. We, yes. And, and Brittany Robertson, when she became a member, she said, I decided to become a member because I love NPR. The reporters ask amazing questions and don't back down. 
I know a lot because of WBEZ. Well, thank you, Brittany. We are able to not back down because you don't back down, because you step up and support us, making sure we have what we need to do this job right. Join Brittany, get in on this dollar for dollar match, and get your name entered for the safari. Call 888-915-9239 or go online to wbez.org slash donate. And so you're thinking, okay, dollar for dollar match, trip to, you know, trip to South Africa. What else do you have for me? Okay, how about this? If you join us at $12 a month, your contribution will become $24 because we're in a matching period. And it goes into the drawing for the trip to South Africa. And we have what we call the last day pack. So you're going to get a public radio tote, uh, I Heart NPR pint glass and a WBEZ keychain. Oh my gosh, that is so many things. I mean, I bet you can't even repeat all those things. <laughs> Become a member. Join us at twelve dollars a month. Have your contribution doubled. Get your name in the drawing to South Af for the South African trip. Get this last day pack and support news and information that you've been relying on all day. WBEZ.org slash donate triple eight nine one five nine two three nine. The number again triple eight nine one five nine two three nine. Or you can go online to WBEZ.org slash donate. And thank you. This is All Things Considered. From NPR News, I'm Ari Shapiro. And I'm Audie Cornish. Since the existence of whistleblower complaint became known, each day has brought enough news to fill a week. Today was no different. First, a reminder of how we got here. It's been eight days since the existence of the complaint became public. Day 974 of the Trump administration. Once again, we have breaking news tonight centering around that explosive whistleblower complaint one day later, some of the specific allegations leaked. Allegations that President Trump pressured Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to look for dirt on former Vice President Joe Biden and his son. President Trump has already admitted he spoke with Zelensky about Joe Biden and his son Hunter. It was largely the fact that we don't want our people, like Vice President Biden and his son, creating to the, the corruption already in the Ukraine. As more information about the phone call, came out, congressional Democrats, including Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, escalated their talk about impeachment. By Tuesday, the Speaker was avoided any and all talk about impeachment, shifted her position. The actions of the two presidents have endured the sound of the and the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. Therefore, today, I'm announcing the House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. As House Democrats spoke out in support of that inquiry, the White House released its account of that conversation between President Trump and the Ukrainian president. Predictably, reactions to that summary fell along party lines. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham saw nothing wrong with the conversation. From my point of view, to impeach any president over a phone call like this would be insane. Democrat Hakeem Jeffries had a different take. To commence an investigation of the Biden family to dig up political dirt in order to bolster the president's electoral prospects in 2020. That is textbook abuse of power, and the transcripts have become Exhibit A in that regard. And this morning, after eight days, a version of the complaint was released, and the House Intelligence Committee heard from one of the central figures at the heart of this storm. We will come to order. Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff was the one swinging that gavel and overseeing the hearing with Acting Director of National Intelligence Joseph McGuire. Chairman Schiff, welcome back to the program. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be with you. Let me first ask you about one revelation in the whistleblower complaint, which is that after President Trump asked Ukraine's president to look into the Biden family, the White House locked down all records of the call, putting them into a separate electronic system to handle especially sensitive classified information. Have you ever heard of the White House doing something like that? No, I haven't, and I can't imagine what circumstance would make that appropriate. Apparently, this computer system is designed for classified information involving very sensitive intelligence programs like covert action. So they clearly thought this needed to be in a place where very few people would have access to the conversation. And that conversation really wasn't notable except for the extraordinary fact that the president was trying to get political help. So it's not as if... Um, this was classified for some other reason. This was apparently sequestered away because those who did understood just how damaging this kind of conduct would be. 
What about the Ukrainian president's statement yesterday in his meeting with Trump that no one pushed me? Uh, if he didn't feel pressure to investigate Biden in that phone call, does it make it harder for you to make the case that this was a quid pro quo? First of all, he clearly did feel pressure uh, to investigate the vice president. And Even if he says he didn't? Well, he succumbed to it by saying during the conversation that he would be doing that investigation and he would look forward to getting more information from the Trump, uh, presumably, Justice Department for how they could uh, satisfy the president's wishes. The Ukraine president felt, I think, compelled to do so, and I think that's borne out by the transcript. I would also point out the particularly difficult position that the Ukraine president is in. If the president acknowledges what is so obvious from the readout of that call, that he's been pressured by the president of the United States, and he comes out and says it, he knows that whatever prayer he has of getting any support from this president is essentially gone. So you're saying the pressure is ongoing? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, and you can see and so many allegations in the complaint, and, and so understandably, what a difficult position the president's actions put Ukraine in, what a difficult position they put our diplomats in. They're all trying to figure out how to navigate around this. And of course, we know very little to date about the actions of Rudy Giuliani that predates and postdate this call, and what additional pressure was brought to bear through that emissary. How far are you going to go? How deep are you going to dig? I mean, Republicans are going to accuse.